Hello everyone, my name is Puyan. I'm CG supervisor slash VFX artist at Method Studios. And I'm going to play the little bit of Methods Reel while I'm getting ready the stuff so you guys can So now that I got everyone excited, I'm gonna explain a little bit about what we're gonna to cover today. Um, I'm gonna to actually go through uh, setting up Spider-Man's webs um, for commercials. This is the actual tool that we use. This is the actual setup that we use for many commercials. And I'll just show you a uh, quick uh, montage of all the shots of the Spider-Man that we use this tool. So we Use this uh, same setup for all the all these tools. Um, this clock says it's 408, but I'm sure it's a uh, Toronto time probably. Um, <clears throat> the actual um, shot that I want to show you guys that we're gonna do is uh, this. Uh, um, it's this setup. We're gonna do this uh, all the way through. You just go ahead and open it up. Uh, we're gonna cover. Um, from basics to some advanced stuff. Um, I see some people that I know that um, are not familiar with Houdini, so I'll cover some uh, basics and I'll go through you know, some advanced stuff. So I think if you're basic, immediate, advanced, it, this still benefits you. Um, <clears throat> so one of the main reasons I, we came out with this setup was that um, for commercials is that we, I, I was able to get my hands on the feature uh, spider web setup and that was very, very slow for what we wanted to do, uh, especially for commercials. And then we decided to just redo it. And this, I mean, it's about a like, hundred times faster. You, know, you can almost scrub through it. Uh, let's go ahead and get started. I think your screen is a little bit bigger, so it helps. Um, let me know if you can't see anything so I can cover it. So the first thing, the first thing that you can see uh, with the spider web is that, we don't, that the first thing we have to do is that we have to connect from one point to the other. 
Um, and it's from one point from the shooter to multiple points on whatever collision objects or the collider. Um, and I'm just using Houdini's test object as my collision object. Um, <clears throat> and let me just go ahead and unhide everything else. And I have uh, the Spider-Man on the other side as the, um, as the source point. So let me just go ahead and cover. One of the reasons that I added this um, Um, this funny bent to this character is because I wanted to make sure that my setup here works with a uh, deforming object because obviously a lot of times we do setups that works with static object, but um, once you stop, once, you, once it starts moving, uh, it starts to break. So the first thing we're going to do, we're going to get our source, source point, which is you've got a uh, Spider-Man model and you zoom in, I'll just choose one point inside the shooter. And as you can see here, it's this one is... The, calling it the shooter point. So that's my main point. So I'm going to refer to this shooter uh, source multiple times. So keep that in mind. And then I've got my collision geometry here. And the way we're going to... Um, <clears throat> this does happen. It's not a big deal. Um, so the way we're going to tell where to attach the points is that I'm going to use a paint sop. And I'm literally just going to paint a couple of points at somewhere. I'm just going to duplicate this and and do some more, like if I do any number of uh, brush strokes that I do connect to that. And the way I do it is um, basically I'm telling uh, this blast stop to get rid of everything that's not, uh, that is blue. And then I create a connectivity so I can tell, so I can uh, get an idea of what each one is. Um, <clears throat> Let me go ahead and bring the attribute spreadsheet. All right, it's now called geometry spreadsheet. So you can see here that my points have a class attribute because I'm creating them here. Um, in here, I'm creating a name attribute for each class. And I'll, I'll go back to some of these. Uh, if I'm going too fast, I'll go back to it because it makes sense a little afterwards once I do it. Um, and I call randomize the color. I just use the randomized color. I like to see everything visually because uh, to test it out. If I set a uh, randomized color to this, I can see that each one of the name attributes is getting different colors, so I know each one is getting a different attribute. And the other thing I'm going to do, I'm scattering some points um, on these sections, and these are basically the number of connections that go to each point. And as you can see here, the total number of points that I create is 28, and I'm using the same... Uh, total number to duplicate um, <clears throat> to duplicate the source point, so I can create one line per point here. And I'm using this attribute interpolate to basically say deform these points by the geometry. So as my character is moving, um, this is a very very important step to check your deforming geometry as you go, because a lot of times what I see is that like you do a whole setup and at the end you'll see that the point count is changing your, and your effects is flickering. That's why I created the bend. So every step when I go, I check to make sure that like my point count on every frame um, is still 28. Um, I'll talk about this in a little bit, but I'm basically getting a centroid, like the center of this uh, section. So what we've got now, we've got our source point and our destination or collision. And with this attribute drop, or attribute wrangle. I'm basically saying get the first position and get the second position, um, create a point and create a, a primitive with vertices and basically that creates a line uh, for each one of these points that I have. And over here, because I have my uh, <clears throat> center attribute, I'm creating the center line. And I'll, t I'll show you guys what I'm using the center line for. This is my center line if I Disable it, you can see that I'm creating a center line. I'll be using the center line to, to pull the web towards the center so it, it gives it that cool web look. Um, go ahead, I'm promoting the attribute. I'll show you guys how to use it. So basically what I've got in here, I have my center line and I have um, the rest of the lines. And what I'm doing here is that when I calculate the center line, you can see that sometimes that actually um, 
that actually lands inside the body. So I'm bringing it back on the surface of the body. So that's that. I'm creating a line ID. Basically, we've got, if you guys remember, there's 28 lines and I'm creating a line ID. So I have an idea of each one of the lines that I'm going to be using later on. Um, resampling it so I have more points uh, so I can pull them together and create more uh, detail. Um, this is actually pretty important to follow along this uh, tutorial. And that's uh, basically I'm creating a pair line ID in this vertex print index. Basically, it says, for each line, create a uh, create an ID attribute for each one of these points, but every line has the same attribute. So I created a quick visualizer here so that you can see. Every line has this ID attribute that says, all right, this is point zero of this line, this point zero of this line, and I'll tell you guys in one second what I'm using this for. And I'll be using this throughout this uh, setup. Um, so what I'm doing here again is, you can see these are my main lines, and that's the center line. And with this attribute up, basically because I had because I had the same number of the center line as the same uh, line ID number in here, I say find out the position, find 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 me the point on this line that has the same line ID attribute, and basically pull towards it with this ramp. So you can see that if I enable and disable this node, this gives me this you know stretch this Spider-Man web look. And you can see that if I adjust this, this curve, um, it gives us the look that we want. Let me just uh, undo. And each step of the process, the other reason for the deforming is that I ice crop to make sure everything is super fast still. You know, this is not real time, but it's pretty close to real time. And, and that's, that's the type of speed we need in commercials. Um, so I created this node because I saw that on like, uh, extreme positions. Um, if I go in here, you can see that my line is going inside the body. And basically, I'm using the VDB of the body, which is a, yeah, I created this little small visualizer here, which has like positive and negative numbers and vectors and says, if it's inside, push it out. And in here, I'm using this setup to actually push it out of the body on extreme cases without having to do any sort of uh, <clears throat> simulation. In extreme cases, if the character spins and does anything crazy, we have to go th through simulation. We still see, even with pushing out of the body, it's pretty fast. Um, smoothing it out a little bit over here. And in here, I'm creating a rest attribute. Hopefully you guys are um, familiar with rest attribute. It basically says, uh, where is my position at a specific time? So I can use that position, that frozen position to create noise and for shading and all sorts of purposes. I'll be using that, um, this same little small um, subnet. Um, I'll cover this part attribute in a little bit. Um, <clears throat> so as you can see, we have our main lines and everything else we do to after this, depends on these main lines. Um, so I'm going to scrub it again, make sure everything works. And the other thing you have to make sure is that as you're scrubbing, you want to make sure to check the point count, make sure everything, the primitive stays the same and the point count stays the same because if that changes, everything else starts changing. Um, I'm actually going to disable the sim. I'm going to go over it at the end so you guys can see um, the result. Um, there you go. That's my main lines. In this little section, I'm going to cover how, how to add um, these connection details. And I think this is you know, pretty nifty, you know, a little cool part of this tutorial is, is this section. And if you pay attention to these uh, few notes here, I'm going to be using it in multiple places. As you can see in the commercial, not all the webs were shooting webs. Some of them were just like wrapping around something. But in a lot, most of them, I use the same technique to um, <clears throat> I create the same look. So basically what I'm doing in here, that's very important, is I've got a ton of points and we want to basically make a lot of connections between these points. And what I say is that, what I'm trying to tell the computer is like, take this point and connect it to a few random points uh, based on a distance. And if I'm running a, yeah, if I'm using this function called near point, basically this near point is going to use 
um, it's going to give me like five points or whatever. Um, over here, I'm saying give me a thousand because I'm only using a little bit of it. Um, it's going to give me a thousand closest points. And the reason I'm freezing the time here to get the, these, uh, these points, for example, if I'm connecting to point 80, from point 433 to 8042, if I go to a different frame that actually has animation, the distance between these points are going to be different. So it's actually going to find different points. And, and it'll, it'll keep trying to connect to the closest point on every frame. It'll create this jittered look. So what I'm doing here, instead of, instead of finding all those values every frame, is what I do is I first say, hey, on frame 1001, look around and find out the, a thousand, the thousand closest points and store it in this attribute. And if I go to geometry spreadsheet, you can see that my near attribute, it has, it's an array and it has a number of points. So if I look at point zero, if I actually go in and find point zero, you can see that it's first find finds itself, which we don't really need. And it finds a bunch of other points that you can connect to later on. And on this side, what I'm telling it to do is actually make the connection. And I can cover that a little bit in here as well. Basically what I'm saying here is, <clears throat> Get the attribute, the near point attribute from the second input. Um, this this value is for shading, and I say for every for every array attribute that you find in there, make a connection. And this is the same setup as up there where you created create a primitive, which each one of these lines is primitive, and you create a vertices and you basically creates a line. Uh, you can see what I'm doing in here. I'm making I'm only making a fraction of the points. And as you remember, I was, I was looking up a thousand points for each point within the distance of 0.5. So I'm gonna increase this guy a little bit so you guys see what happens. So it starts creating all these connections. And I couldn't really just say, oh, only find five points and only connect those points because it would only find the closest points and it would create this very geometrical look. But instead what I'm doing here is I'm creating all these uh, I'm creating all these lines and I'm deleting a lot of them so you create this like very random look and in order to show you I want to focus on this a little bit because this is an important part of the setup I'm using it multiple times in different places I want to show you so like you can just see the setup is still pretty fast and if I delete this guy and this basically now calculates where to connect every frame you can see that based on different frames if the distance changes it starts it starts creating new points and as the character moves you'll see you'll see a big change will happen right now because the the actual shape changed i'm going to turn this guy back on and one of the things i want to talk about with this note and the reason i created this ramp is that these are some of the things that we need to be careful about and you know keep in mind we're trying some trying to make something optimized and that could be the difference of this playing you know almost a scrubbable setup versus something that you can't even play with. Um, I'm creating a lot of connections in here. And as you see, there's thousands of points in here. And basically what I'm telling it in this setup is that as you get farther and farther from this like wide cone, start making less and less connections between the lines. So you can see over here, there's almost like when, when we get towards the end, there's no connections. So if I actually increase this up a little bit, you can see that it starts making all these connections. But if I zoom out, that we're not gonna see any of that stuff. And that's, you know, that could be the difference between you know, 12,000 primitive and like 12 million primitives. All right, so this is the same. So this, this little connection, you know, it's like web connection set up. Um, I'm repeating it again. I could have just put it in a for loop, but I wanted different settings for here. And because it's only twice, I wanted to repeat it. Um, I decided to just put it in there as opposed to making a for loop. Um, so you can see I'm resampling it. So I get a little bit more connection so I can connect from this point to this point as well. If I don't have this resample, there's, not, there's no point here for it to connect. I'm repeating the same thing with a little bit of different, set, different settings in here. So now you can see that now my web has a little bit more complicated look. It's not only connection between two points and there is now 
connections on top of connections. And depending on commercials, if you did like probably too many commercials with this web, and every client wanted it a little bit different. They wanted some, some, of, some clients want it more complicated, so you can easily just add levels of complication. And one cool thing I want to show you is that, actually I'm turning this on so you can see, there you go. So when I didn't have those points, it wasn't creating all these interesting looks because there was no points to connect to. There you go. So I want to show you how you can use some of these, you know, the blocks of um, nodes that you create. If I repeat this one more time, you could see, I'm just going to connect it in here. You can see now I get an extra level of coolness. Um, hold on a second. There we go. So now I'm getting extra levels of, um, I think some, some, some of the commercials that we did, we did like an extra level, but I think for most of the commercials, that's, they were pretty happy with that. Um, so that's our level two connection. Um, I basically sort of divided all the little things that we add to this web to like multiple sections. That's the main section. Um, in this little section, I'll show you guys how I'm doing it. I'm going to be covering um, these sort of like um, side connections. Uh, let's take a look at it. Let's go through. So basically, I'm getting the same main lines. And in here, it's super important because as you guys remember, I created those. Um, I created those pair line ID attribute where it says this, this point is zero, this point is one, this point is two. And what I'm doing here with a, um, <clears throat> with a copy stamping is that I say every few, um, basically delete every, keep every like 10th point of the line or eighth point of the line and make connections between them. And this connection setup, it looks pretty familiar. It's doing the same exact thing as the other one. Basically, you know, it gets where the connection points are and creates the connections. Um, if you guys are not familiar with copy stamping, it's um, a little bit of a hard concept to explain, but I'll try to take a shot at it a little bit. Um, so basically copy stamping is that I'm telling this to copy this four times, but every time it copies it, it's kind of like a for loop. It also creates this attribute called CY that I can use to change things. So uh, copy one has a CY attribute of one, copy two has a CY attribute of two. And in here, I can use those attributes to say, on one, delete line one, on copy two, delete you know, points that have ID two. And I'm using it in here, as you can see, I'm taking that attribute, that CY attribute, in here, and basically I just like multiply it by a random number, multiply by 23 because I have so many lines, and you can see that I say every 23 points keep one point. So if I just change that value to every three, you can see that it every three points is creating, and it's only four copies. And if I go more copies, it start creating. Uh, Every four lines is going to create something. And let's go back. So that's the part that it creates these sidelines. The other thing I'm doing, I'm using the carve node to make sure that each one of these lines, um, every one is a separate primitive. And I'll explain to you a little bit because in here, I'm using the same vertex prim attribute to create UVs for this, um, the side U. I resample, and you can see why I'm resampling. And remember, I talked about the shooter source, and it's the same color. In here, you can see that with this swap, basically what I'm saying is that get these points and pull it a little bit towards uh, towards the source using this ramp that you apply along the side. So you can see that if I can just apply, change the ramp up, you can see that it changes the look. Um, creating these attributes because I'm using it somewhere else. So that is my side webs. And I can just merge it out with this guy and I get this, the same look. Um, the other thing that I'm doing a little bit, you know, there's different ways. There's always different ways to do things and like more optimized ways. Some of the things that I've done here are not the most optimized way to do it, but um, it was just so much faster than what we had. And I was like, well, this is good enough. We can just put it in the farm. Um, 
the one thing that we did, we sent it out to the client and they told us that the lines look a little bit clean and not like an organic whip. So what I did is that with the same um, stamping trick where it says, and put that number back in here and change something. I'm noising, noising the lines up a little bit, as you can see. And I'm making three of them. And each, each one of them has a little bit of different noise. I'm doing the same thing. So this little setup, I'm putting, I'm using it in a couple of different places. Uh, we got the same notes on my main lines. And I pretty much did the same thing. I'm copying them five times. You can see that every time I adjust this, I'm copying them five times and I just added some noise to it. The one thing to notice about this little noise setup is that it does get a little bit, like you can see that it, it, it is noisy, but the noise goes up and down. So parts of it is not noisy and parts of it is noisy. And that is because they asked us to create a web that looks like it's got different thicknesses, kind of like a spider web. If you look super close, you can see that it's got areas that gets thick and then it gets back thin again. Pretty much what I'm doing here. Uh, I want to see if I can show you guys. What I'm doing here is I'm applying a, let me just disable this. I'm applying a generic, you know, just randomize the noise based on the position. You know, it creates, adds a little bit of noise you can see in here. So basically adds a little bit of noise with different, uh, with different offset to each line. And I create another noise. If I press X, you can see it here. And this noise is basically a 1D noise and says, this is also a noise based on rest position, but it says, this is a value of 0.1, this is a value of one. So this multiplies by the noise and it gives us this. Let me go ahead and delete this. It gives us this look of like thinness and thickness. All right, let me back up a little bit. That's this section. So up to here, we have covered this. The other thing that makes the web look really cool is the connection points. And that's something that I'm also gonna cover. So basically what, I've, what we've got in here, actually, let me show you what we're gonna achieve. This is gonna be the end result. These are our, uh, wait for us. So this is the connection point that it creates between the actual web and the actual collision geometry. Um, <clears throat> so we've got the same, same problem to solve here. We've got these lines and we've got, we have a collision geometry. We need to connect to it, but we also need to connect to it in like a cool fashion. So what I'm doing here is that I am referencing the same collision geometry. The reason I'm doing this is I'm, I'm getting this object merge from the same node in here is because I can easily um, make this into an OTL. And they'll basically just say a connection one and connection two and everything else will work fine. As long as you're using these two, that should work fine. So that, that's my collision geometry. All right. So first thing, first thing I'm doing is I'm getting the first point and this is this is important because you remember we talked about the pair line ID and that was each line has um, the same numbers of the lines. So I'm using the same thing in here to create the same effect. So I say, take, remove everything but line zero. So that's my first point. And then I say, and take, also take point zero and I'll explain to you guys why I'm doing this. And then I say, use point let me see if i can make this one so you can see so that was my point zero point zero again and point 14 and point 15 and when i connect all of these together you can see that it creates this like super hard shape so basically i say get these points get that and just connect them all together and then if i convert them to and there, it's going to interpolate between them and it's going to create this awesome, nice looking thing in here. The one thing that I haven't covered yet, oops, is that 
The reason I created two first points and these are identical is that one of them, what I did is I just put in a point replicate and I basically just made them a little bit wider. So you can see that like this is my point zero, that's my point one, two and three. And when I connect all of them together, each line gets the same thing. Um, what I'm doing here is when I, so that's the other important thing is that when I, if you can see, let me go ahead and turn this back on. When I use point replicate, it doesn't, it doesn't spread it out on the skin. So I replicate it, make it a little bigger, and then I basically ray it back on the object. So now it's back on the object, but it doesn't deform with the geometry. It's all deformed with the geometry in here. You can see that the points are moving with the geometry. Um, if I had this, the points would be moving with the geometry, but they wouldn't be on the object. So that's my first point, collision point. In here, what I'm doing is that I'm getting point zero, point one, point two, and point three, and I create a um, primitive uh, for each point, and I'm connecting them all together. You can see I'm converting them to nerves. Convert them back to polygons because I have some other processes that I run on it. My whole setup is polygons. I'm creating the line here because I'm using a shader. So this was actually like a super late note that we got from the client, even though it's, as you can see, like if I go to the end result, it's pretty hard to see. They asked us to add some more connections between these. And you know, good thing we've had this, this little three node set up and I'm basically using it everywhere. So you can see that I had these um, connection points that looked not so complex. And once you add these, same, same thing, you know, find all the points around one point and connect to it. And this is the width attribute basically just for render. And we have got our uh, web. So this doesn't have any dynamics. They also want, now I want to go to dynamics. So the reason I emphasize in the beginning a lot about um, <clears throat> making sure the topology is the same is that now that I've got this web, the topology is the same. All the connections are going to be always the same because all the lines are, all the points are the same number. Now what I can do is I can own, I can do whatever I want on the main lines and everything else will follow seamlessly. So if I go up here just for fun, if I go up here and and just select a bunch of points. Actually, let's do soft transform. And then just pull it up. You can see that my end result would be the same. And if I can just actually basically animate this, which I've actually done this for some shots, I was just like, oh, I'll just animate this a little bit because they wanted some jiggle. Um, a little bit, so I can actually just bring this down and I'll have the same point count, same look, same width, everything else would attach in the same exact way. All right, let me go ahead and delete this. So now that I showed you guys that because I made sure this is flexible, like this has the same point count, I can now go ahead and show you guys that I'm gonna run some simulations on the web attachment. And, and that's basically, this a you know, little bit of jiggle once it attaches. I increased it a lot and compared to what the client wanted, just so you guys can see it, but the client wanted just a tiny bit. Let's go ahead and take a look at that. Set up. Undo. I'm gonna cover two different types of. So if you've been to the Vellum class before this, it's got a little bit of the same thing. So basically what I'm doing, forget about this grayed out noise space, it was just something that I tried. Um, I've got my points. What I want to make sure is that I want to make sure that the, pump, the point that attaches to Spider-Man is solid, it never moves. The point that attaches to the bad guy, or Tim, the Houdini guy, um, is also always not, never changing. So what I create is create this uh, attribute called um, pin to animation. And I'm using the first and the last point of each each uh, each primitive uh, primitive uh, vertex. 
As you can see, I'm saying primitive vertex if it's zero or if it's the last one, pin to animation and never move it. And in here, you can look at my vellum node. I say create a permanent um, connection that never changes. I'm not going to cover too much of vellum because the last class covered it, but I'll cover a little bit. You know, I've got, you know, saying this is basically a string. I didn't use a uh, cloth server and thing like that because these are basically a string. And also, I could have probably done this with wire solver and it would have probably be in the same speed. You know, the, the beauty of Vellum is, you know, in like large scale things, but Vellum is new and cool. So I just like, why not use Vellum? Um, so that's my string solver. And the other thing that I have is my target. And basically what target is that is that on every frame it says that try to keep the main shape and that's what's giving us that jello jello look basically once the once the web goes out it wants to maintain come back to its shape if i don't have this which i'll try to run a simulation you can see that it does go up but it doesn't come back down kind of like a cloth solver if you've got a cloth that you're moving the cloth goes down but it'll never get the same shape it doesn't have any but for this setup because there's a lot of connections i wanted to make sure it maintains its shape in here, let's look at it. Okay, so the other thing I'm doing in here, which I could be doing with different setups, is that I'm adding a little bit of a fake velocity. I can basically animate something and get it. Basically, I'm saying that velocity of one, which is x, and negative, uh, negative y. So I say, imagine if the web is shooting towards the guy. I'll cover the shooting as well. I'm doing the shooting procedural. I mean, the web is shooting at the guy. <clears throat> they'll probably have some velocity to going towards the guy and I'll have some like uh, gravity velocity. Uh, so I'm gonna go in here, show you the setup. I'm not really doing much with the volume solver besides disabling self collision because you don't really see any self collision. And it actually starts at frame 1008 because first eight frames I'm doing the shooting and I'll cover that in a little bit. So you can see that, let me just hide the points and play it. can see it gets a little bit of jiggle it tries to you know react with gravity and the, the initial velocity but still maintains the same look and the other thing that helps is that the guy the other reason i did the um <clears throat> the target constraint is that the guy is moving spider-man is moving it's not a constant it's not something that's going to always stay the same so as the guys are moving, I want the simulation to be doing the simulation of the jiggle and move with the guys. So this is a simulation. It's pretty simple and it's pretty useful for a lot of things. But this is a production demo. But I also want to show you guys how I do things in production and like sometimes what things we do to cheat it a little bit. I think for most shots, when I looked at the setup, if you look at it in here, I think... Let me just look at the procedural. The client wanted just something super simple. And I was like, I looked at the dynamic and if this is going, you know, to hundred shots, um, you look at it and say, you know what? I have to, I have to sim it and I have to look at it make sure it looks okay. And I have to cache it and re render it out. So I was like, well, you know what? This is just a little bit of motion. Maybe I can just do that with some procedural animation. I'll cover this procedural animation as well. It's kind of cool. Um, I'm doing the same thing in here. I say the first point and the last point don't change at all, but just do a little bit of an arc that you make, uh, that you have an influence on. Just go ahead and look at this guy. And go ahead and multiply this by five. So I get something insane. And I'm gonna get rid of this so you can see every step what I'm doing. So basically, Okay. One second, where is my sign? Let me actually connect this back up. I'm not sure why this is not working. Oh, it's right, because I'm, I'm multiplying with that. But so basically what I'm doing, I say basically I'm getting sign of time, which is basically just a wave going up and down. Uh, let me make sure, I'm not sure why the points are showing, but there you go. 
So as you can see, this is creating this insane motion of just going up and down. And I'm controlling everything with just like one animation parameter that says starts from frame 1010 10 and 1040. And I create the ramp that basically goes down and says start at 1 and go to 0. And you can see that the sine wave as time goes on just gets smaller and smaller. Um, initially when I did this, all the lines moved together and it looked kind of fake. And I was like, well, you know what? The lines are going to play against each other. Not each line has the same strength and density. So I, I just multiplied it by some uh, random attribute. I'm going to increase the random attribute by something insane. So you can see that when the lines are moving, when I disable this, you can see every, each one of them moving at the same rate. But this one, they're moving in a little bit different rate. So when you look at the final result, even though it's just very subtle, you can see that the lines play against each other. So that basically is, you know, a little bit of a neat trick as far as like how to do something super fast that you don't need for some shots. Some shots actually we did we we did have to do it. Let me go ahead and remove these notifications so we don't get something that's a little bit more sane. Anyway, so for this example, because I didn't want to take a lot of time simming, I'm basically going for the procedural route, but I also have the dynamic route if I need it to. Let's go back out, wait for it to do something. So now that I've, got, I've said everything, the other part that I'm going to cover is the actual shooting part. We were thinking about, you know, I think we tried, you know, going different routes with, you know, creating some kind of animation of the thing, like hand animate or simulation, but 99.9% .9 of the shots, it was, this is actually slower than what it's supposed to be in the shots, but it was literally just like a two frame blur of like the web going out because Spider-Man is so awesome. Um, so I created this shoot away animation thing. And basically, all, all you do is just change this animation. Change this one parameter. Let me go back out here. Let me go back out here and just show you what it does. And it's kind of straightforward, but it's kind of a neat look. What I'm doing here, and I'm using different, different, different ways of doing things just to show the different ways you can do things. And you remember I was object merging my source point. You can also basically just use op the syntax to bring that source point instead of shooter source. So I'm bringing that point in with that instead of actually object merging and connecting to the second one. This is another trick. I wanted to do it differently so you can see different ways to do it. Um, let me get rid of all the other fancy noise so you can see what's happening in the background, the basics. So basically what I'm doing is say, get the first, get the shooter point, you know, basically the point in here. And I just say it's just one point, so only bring point zero. And based on this animation curve that I'm creating in here, bring it back to bring it back towards Spider-Man. And you can see that if I just scrub, you can see that it's just basically well the opposite. Go from the hand and to Spider-Man. And I was like, well, that looks boring. So let's go ahead and add some noise to it. When I added noise to it, it basically added the noise everywhere. So again, I had to use like a ramp based on my, uh, based on each line's uh, per line attribute to say whenever the line is close to hand, don't do anything. And I also had to like multiply it by um, the distance and how, how close it gets to the hand. But basically the same attribute just drives the shooting. And if you go up here, I created a couple of other things. You see, anyways, let me see if I can uh, play blast this and see if we can see our full result. So, as you can see, like I skipped over some of the attributes that I was creating, and I'll cover those in a little bit. And you can see that 
for different reasons, you know, the compositors always want different control because oh, I want the connection to point to be a little bit stronger. I want the, you know, the main lines to show up as stronger. So I created all these attributes as you were looking at it, it was called part, part attribute. Uh, so I've got three main parts in here. I've got the connection parts, the, you know, the, the whatever you want to call it, the, I don't know what it is, the main lines and the rest of it. And then, just so we cover a little bit of what goes out to shading, I want to show you guys what I'm doing in here is that I always want to give compositors just like more and more things that they can play with. Um, one of the things that we created was uh, just a bit noise based opposition. And if you press X, it will visualize whatever note without actually having to do anything to render. So this is just some noise and this is a sort of random number based on primitive number. And I'm giving it, the one thing I like to do is this one, it says every 50 point is blue, every 10 point is, is 20 point is red and so on and so forth. So they have different control. Um, and this one, I'm basically doing it based on point, just gives it a different look. The reason we created this is that the client was like, on some parts of the sh shot, we want some, uh, some sections of the line to have a glint. Obviously, you can do that with uh, <clears throat> reflections, but it doesn't always happen the way you want it. So you create these different attributes to help them out. Um, I think that is about it. I was going to cover a little bit of shading, but I think I don't know, you guys want to do a little bit of Q&A or go a little bit in shading? The shading is not that complicated, it's just a reflective, a refractive, uh, both. Um, I basically, I'm giving here, the other thing that I, I was doing in there is that I was giving each line a little bit different uh, value. And I want to, I just created this so you guys can see a little bit of uh, when you render, what comes out of it. Um, these are basic normal. Uh, this is actually a pretty large image, so I can zoom in a little bit. So you can see that my, this is not the best quality, but you can see that this is reflecting the, reflecting and refracting the environment. The one pass that was pretty essential to us was this glint pass. And it was the other thing where it says they wanted some lines to glint, but they also wanted some sections of the, the web to have a little bit of glint. I in increased it by a lot so you can see it, but this was something where, once the web attached to something, um, don't know how much I would, you could see here. It has a little bit of a, you know, a little bit of that like cool glowiness in there. You can see these, you can see these little dots. A lot of times that kind of stuff, you automatically get it with shadering because it's overlapping and it's reflecting a super hot light, but this was an extra layer that we provided to comp. And let's see what else we've got in here. And that's the same stuff that we talked about. And this is, I don't want to go to the shader setup because it's not that complicated and I'll leave just a tiny bit of time for anyone who has any questions. And, um, oh, I also want to show you guys again, the, the difference between the dynamic and the procedural. And you can see the dynamic is super exaggerated because the web looks very loose. But so this was the, this was the result I was getting with the dynamic setup. And Let's there you go. So you can see, I'm gonna play it a couple times so you can see. This is just a little bit jiggle. And then if I go back in here, almost the same look. I think the dynamic, it's a little bit better, but this is, a, you remember, this is a static camera on the web and we almost, in movies, never have that. It's always like something's crazy going on or the camera's moving. Um, that's about it. I want to leave the last uh, few minutes for questions, if you guys have any questions. Go ahead. Uh, I was going to ask you if you would, uh, that section of nodes, there's two attribute wranglers, a couple of other things that you kept copying. Mm -hmm. That first attribute wrangle, could you show uh, what's inside? Like, I, I didn't catch everything. Uh, this one? Yeah. Yeah, well, that first, this is actually the easy part of it. I could have put both of them in one thing, but I put them in two, two different things because I wanted to get the, the connection points on a frozen time, point in time because I didn't want to change. Basically, all this is doing in here, it says, find near points close to every point. And it says, so if I just look at this guy in here, 
Uh, let's go ahead. What is going on? There you go. So, oh, there you go. Oh, I'm on the second one. That's why. So pretty much the same thing. If I actually, if, I'm going to try and see if I can, I can't find 0, but like literally if you look at, if I go to geometry spreadsheet and find 0.6416, which I'm actually going to do for fun. If you press S, select that one point. If you go to geometry spreadsheet and say view selected only, and in here, if you look at it in here, it says find all the points that are close to you. And basically if you can see is, You've got 8822, which is this guy. You've got zero, which is right there. You've got 47. So basically you say, what are the points that are close to me? And on the second one, you say, make the connections between those points. And then second one, it's a little bit, I mean, it's not too hard, but it's a little bit complicated. It's a little bit um, confusing how you basically, if you create a primitive and add two vertices on the, each side of it, it automatically makes a line. So if I get rid of like the vertices in here, uh, you can see that it doesn't create a line. So for a primitive to exist, you have to have one primitive and two vertices and it'll say, boom, there's a line. Uh, there's other ways you can do it and probably do it with like the add stop and make the same, but this is a lot more flexible. Uh, does that answer the question? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Anybody else? We have uh, a few minutes. Go ahead. How did you create that feed pass that you showed in the contact sheet for like the hotspots? Oh, the the feed pass that I showed for contact sheet. It's it's pretty simple. I can show you. Super quick. So if I go to shading, it's basically just the noise that. Uh, so if I go to wet material. Uh, I'm applying that to my emission because in real time I wanted just to have a little bit of glint look, but it's pretty simple. I'm basically just getting the rest position and and some noise. The trick is all inside this uh, is this fit node. You know, you just basically fit the node so much, so you just only get a tiny bit of uh, crunched up noise. Yeah, super crunched up noise. Um, Yeah, that's about it. And the, other, the only thing I'm doing is that they wanted the glint to move a little bit, is, and they also created this, oops, created this time attribute that just basically goes through the noise and just creates just a little bit of glinty cool. action. Oh, go ahead. The, uh, when you're throwing the line, uh -huh. maybe I just missed this in your presentation, but w were you really just animating those points? No, basically, the, when I was throwing the line, I, all I was saying is that. Um, let's see if I can just. Sorry, my hotkeys are not the same, so it's not. But I say, you remember I said, get the, get the source point. And when you subtract all the points minus the source point position, it gives you this vector. And if you add that vector to your position, it'll bring everything back to theirs. Because the vector, the vector, for example, for this point is like negative 5x. And negative 5x, if you add it to the position, it'll bring it all the way back to the position. So if, if you basically, and pretty much that's what I'm doing here, you get, you get the set, you get points subtract. And this subtract gives me, I'm going to get rid of this. Uh, See, if I don't multiply by anything, because I'm multiplying it by the length of the animation, the, the length of the file, it basically brings everything back to zero. And if I create, I can create a, um, I create a constant here. You can see it a little bit better. So there's a negative vector that tries to put everything back to the point. And in here I say, And see that like do it or don't do it like if I if I subtract it let me see that it brings it all the way back to it. so that's the main animation and all I'm doing is with a little bit of noise while it's going back I'm adding some noise to it so it has this this feeling I think we're right about uh, on time 
thank you very much for uh, coming by and checking out this web presentation.